Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are very happy to have with us James Mills today, a, a local author, uh, not local, sorry, a, an, a, an author uh, and um, just a great guy who's done amazing things for outdoors and nature. And uh, I'll, I'll let him talk more about it, but again, just welcome everybody. If you're having any technical issues with Zoom today, as it happens, please message me and we will try to get you set up. If you give me just a couple of moments to present my screen, uh, we will get started with our introduction. And today we're doing our second spring lecture from our spring lecture series that goes from March to May. Today we are with James Edward Mills, uh, the author of The Adventure Gap. James Edward Mills will discuss how our nation's wild places belong to all Americans, but not all of us use these resources equally. Minority populations are as much less likely to see recreation, adventure, and solace in our wilderness spaces. Bringing this adventure gap often requires role models who can inspire the uninitiated to experience and enjoy wild places. A little bit of an introduction. James Edward Mills is an African-American author, freelance journalist, outdoor guide, and independent media producer. Mills wrote The Adventure Gap Changing the Face of the Outdoors. He has also contributed to numerous publications, including National Geographic, Rock and Ice, and Alpinist. Mills was one of the great, uh, one of the creative minds behind An American Ascent, a documentary chronicling the first all-American ascent at Denali, North America's greatest, uh, highest peak. I will go ahead and do it in Spanish now. Uh, interpretation will be turned on at the end of our introduction. James Edwards Mills es un autor afroamericano, periodista independiente, guía de actividades de aire libre y productor de medios independientes. Mills escribió The Adventure Gap, Changing the Face of the Outdoors. También ha contribuido a numerosas publicaciones, incluidas National Geographic, Rock and Ice, and Alpinist. Mills fue una de las mentes creativas detrás de An American Ascent, un documental que narra el primer ascenso afro afroamericano de Denali, el pico más alto de América del Norte. And with us, we also have Beatriz Soto, a representative from the Wilderness Workshop, uh, their Spanish language chapter, Defiendo Nuestras Tierras. I have her introduction here, just a minute. Beatriz is originally from Chihuahua, Mexico. Through her childhood and youth, she grew up in a bicultural setting between Mexico and the United States. She graduated from Basalt High School and went on to study architecture in Chihuahua City. Having an opportunity to work in both the US and Mexico, she has engaged in a diverse range of architectural and community projects, always with a focus on environmental and social justice. She is currently the director of Defienda Nuestra Tierra for Wilderness Workshop, where she works with environmental and conservation groups across the Western slope of Colorado to tap into the influential voices of the Latinx community on issues regarding environmental and climate, climate justice, public lands management and equitable access, as well as conservation priorities in our area. Beatriz is a co-founding member of Voices Unidas de las Montañas, a local nonprofit organization made up of the Latinx leaders that help create opportunities for leaders to speak and advocate themselves. Beatriz es originaria de Chihuahua, México. Durante su infancia y juventud, creció en un entorno bicultural entre México y los Estados Unidos. Se graduó de Basalt High School y pasó a estudiar ar arquitectura en la ciudad de Chihuahua. Al tener la oportunidad de trabajar tanto en los Estados Unidos como en México, se ha involucrado en una amplia gama de proyectos arqui arquitectónicos y comunitarios, siempre con un enfoque en la justicia ambiental y social. Actualmente es la directora del taller Defiende Nuestra Tierra, donde trabaja con grupos ambientes, ambientales y de conservación en la vertiente occidental de Colorado, 
para aprovechar las voces influyentes de la comunidad latina sobre temas relacionados con la justicia ambiental y climática, la gestión de tierras públicas y la equidad, el acceso así como las prioridades de conservación en nuestra área. Beatriz es miembro cofundadora de Voces Unidas de las Montañas, una organización no local sin fines de lucro formada por líderes latinex que ayudan a crear oportunidades para que los líderes hablen y se defiendan por sí mismos. Okay, and today is a webinar. We will have our chat option open. If you have any questions, uh, any comments for our presenters today, feel free to use our chat box uh, that looks like this. You can also use it for any technical issues you might encounter, and I will try to help you along with those. We will also be using our Q&A. If you have any questions for us to visit at the end of our presentation, the Q&A function is where you put them in. They will be saved for later. Lastly, this is a bilingual presentation. Um, as soon as I turn on interpretation, you will see a, a graded globe symbol at the bottom right of your screen please choose the language you prefer. You have English and Spanish, and you can choose to mute the original audio to not get any interruptions. With that, I will go ahead and turn on interpretation and get ready to begin. Okay, make sure you have the correct channel, English and Spanish, right on the interpretation. With that, oh, I think we lost, I think we lost Beatrice, but that's okay. James, would you like to uh, get us started? I'd be happy to. Alex, thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction. And um, everyone, welcome uh, to this evening's program. Um, as Alex mentioned, my name is James Edward Mills, and I'm a freelance journalist and independent media producer, and I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin. I I am also an instructor of a course at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, a, a class that I created and teach called Outdoors for All. And um, I'm also screening in to you today from the ancestral homeland of the Ho-Chunk people. And I think that it's critically important that we acknowledge wherever you are, the native people that previously occupied the area that you now call home. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen, um, and I'm going to um, lead you through a, um, a kind of a, a detailed discussion on my work. Um, as Alex mentioned, I'm the author of the book, The, Adventure, el autor, the Adventure Gap. Doors. And for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to actually start this discussion um, in an in a area of the country that some of you actually might be familiar with. Um, you might recognize this photograph that um, I took on the Colorado River, um, actually in the Grand Canyon. And in 2016, I had the, uh, the rare privilege of being able to take a rafting trip from one end of the Grand Canyon to the other, from the Put-In at Least Ferry all the way to Diamond Creek. And it's a distance of about 227 miles over the course of 14 days. And if you know anything at all about how difficult it is to get a national park permit, this is actually a result of a successful bid in a national lottery to earn a trip down the Colorado River. And this is the very first time that I've actually had this experience, but I came to realize what a privilege it was for me to have a trip like this. Um, for the last 15 years, my very good friend, uh, Jim Moss, who is a rafting guide on the Colorado River, um, had invited me to come on this trip if you were to win the lottery. And in 2016, as it happened in the centennial year, the 100th anniversary of the creation of the National Park System, our lottery number came up and we were able to take um, a private trip down the Grand Canyon. Now, I had been to the, the Grand Canyon several times before, and on this trip, though, this was the very first time I'd actually been in the canyon on the river. And after several days of paddling at a dinner, as we were talking, just casually getting acquainted with the, the 15 members of our group, Jim leans over to me and says, 
you know, I've been leading trips down this river for the last 40 years, and you're the very first African American that I've ever guided. Now, that was a pretty profound statement to um, have him say that. As I said, I've actually been to the Grand Canyon myself many times. In fact, uh, this photograph was taken on a trip that I took in 1988 with my very best friend, John Mayer, on spring break. We hiked from the um, north rim of the Grand Canyon all the way down to the canyon floor. We hiked down, we, we camped overnight, we had a fantastic trip. But when we take a look and see the Grand Canyon in its entirety, there's actually a, a very clear distinction between who has the ability to have full access to this area and who doesn't. Um, over 4.5 million people will visit the Grand Canyon every year, but only 29,000 people a year will be able to make that trip from one end of the Grand Canyon to the other along the Colorado River. Now, when we, when we stop and we think who those people are, one of the things that we realize is that there is indeed a separation between those who have the disposable income, leisure time, and the desire to make a trip like this. And as it happens, I think in many ways, it kind of defines for me what I describe as the adventure gap. Now, as my own presence there and the presence of other people in the Grand Canyon demonstrate, people of color do indeed have experiences in our wild and scenic places. And it's not fair to suggest for a second that we don't. However, our levels of frequency and also the nature in which we spend time in these wild and scenic places is indeed different. And I think that we need to take the time to stop and think about what that means. So I'm going to take you all the way back to the beginning. And um, if you are at all familiar with the um, the uh, national park areas of, I mean, the um, um, areas of California, specifically in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and forgive me, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with my PowerPoint. So it's going to scroll for a second while it is rebooting. Um, I actually grew up in an, in an area um, it, of, in uh, South Central Los Angeles. Um, in fact, my, my family home is still there today. Um, and this is um, quite literally where I grew up. This is the exact geolocation of the home that I went to high school in, um, where I went off to from college. It's an area called the Mert Park in South Central Los Angeles. Um, but the photograph that I showed you a moment ago was taken at a place called the Baldwin Hills Scenic Overlook. And um, if you take a look at where I grew up relative to where that is, it's literally three miles away from where um, I made my home. And if you go there today, it's an amazing place, almost in the center of downtown Los Angeles, where there is our hiking trails, there is flora and fauna, there are our interpretive rangers that actually tell you the story of the area and how it ultimately came to be. And also, if you take a look at the people that spend time here, it actually is a very good reflection of the population of Los Angeles and Southern California as a whole. A great mix of African-Americans, Hispanics, Asian-Americans, um, and European-Americans living and enjoying this natural resource, um, I think very equitably. But as a kid, it actually looked more like this. It was an incredibly dense industrial area for the extraction of oil. And even today, there's quite a bit of industrial pollution that um, had been inundated in this particular area. And that was true all the way through my childhood in the early 60s, um, well into the 1980s. And it's during the 60s that much of the change that we ultimately saw in the photographs I showed you a moment ago began to happen. Now, everybody probably recognizes the guy on the left, that's Martin Luther King Jr. The guy on the right is my father. Uh, my dad, uh, Billy Jean Mills, was the first African-American to graduate from UCLA Law School in 1954. And he was also a civil rights activist in Southern California. In fact, when the civil rights era was at its heyday, my dad was deeply involved in, in the creation of many of the programs and systems that ultimately created many of the uh, civil rights advances that we had at that time. In fact, in 1963, 
um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to visit my dad. In fact, if you take a look at this photograph, the cut line reads, Dr. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Wright discusses with Billy Mills some of the problems in King's campaign to win equal rights in the Southern integration movement now being conducted in Alabama. Um, so my dad was right there in the, the thick of this huge awakening of civil rights. Um, here, here he is with um, Bobby Kennedy, um, a photograph taken in uh, 1966, not long after his brother, Robert Kennedy um, was assassinated. Here's an, another um, picture with my dad standing next to then Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley. Um, much of what my growing up was like was being able to be part of this incredible political resurgence. And in 1971, this is a photograph of my family. I'm the youngest of five. Um, my sisters, like my mom, became teachers. My brother, like my dad, became um, an attorney. My middle brother became a fitness instructor. And me, as the youngest of five kids, with not as much to live up to, I became what I like to describe as an outdoor guy. Much of my childhood was actually spent spending time in the natural areas not far from Los Angeles in uh, the mountains of the San Bernardinos, of the uh, San Gorgonio, Baton Powell, many of the wonderful Southern California mountains. And I got a very early appreciation for the outdoors, so much so that when I went to college at the University of California at Berkeley, I got a degree in um, cultural anthropology, but then went on to um, be a, a trip leader. Here is a photograph in Yosemite Valley for the very first time um, leading a rock climbing trip. Um, with my college friends, we um, hiked to the top of Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the lower 48 states. Um, after graduation, I went um, on to a career in outdoor recreation working for a few companies that you might have heard of. I started working for REI. Um, and then in, in this photograph, I got a job working for the North Face. And in 1993, I became the very first African American to be a independent sales representative and and um, regional sales manager, basically working in the Midwest West Territory that I currently, um, um, where I currently live today. And from that time, you know, through um, much of the 90s and the early 2000s, I had the ability to quite literally travel around the world, being able to see some really exciting things, doing exciting things in, in fabulous places. But one of the things that I noticed that you might notice in the pictures that I'm showing you is that I was almost always the only person of color. Now, again, at the time, there were indeed plenty of people of color doing things, but very few people who looked like me had jobs in outdoor recreation. I didn't see very many park rangers or naturalists or people working in the field of outdoor recreation. And um, around the, um, the turn of the last century, around um, the events of 9-11 in 2001, 2002, I decided to make a career change to go from being a executive in the field of sales and marketing uh, to shift my skills towards photography and storytelling. And I basically reinvented my career to create a blog and a podcast series called The Joy Trip Project. Now in its 13th season, I tell stories about outdoor recreation, environmental conservation, acts of charitable giving, and practices of sustainable living. Because I, I really think that it's critically important that we create an environment where everyone has the ability to um, enjoy and experience the outdoors in a positive way. Much of my growing up as a kid was actually spent in wild and scenic places. And as I'm trying to tell these stories, I literally try to, to tell the story of great storytellers. In fact, in uh, 2008, some of you might um, be aware of a documentary film series that was created called The National Parks America's Best Idea. And at about that time, I had the opportunity to quite literally go to Yosemite, back to my old stomping grounds, to interview the documentary filmmaker Ken Burns. And here he is with um, a guy who looks a lot like John Muir, who's actually a interpretive storyteller by the name of Lee Stetson. And in period dress and clothing in the guise of John Muir, he tells the story of, how, of the national parks and how they came to be. And one of the things that I wanted to do in the course of my questioning of both these men was to find out what 
could be done to tell a more comprehensive story of our national parks. And he told me the story that many of us know about Teddy Roosevelt visiting with Muir at the beginning of the national park system. And I really wanted to know how this film and other stories would tell the stories of native people, of Hispanics, of African-Americans. Where are their stories in the creation of our national scenic areas, our national parks and monuments? And it was at that point, Burns told me a story. Um, in 1903, um, Teddy Roosevelt actually uh, sent a detachment of African-American soldiers, a, a unit known as the Buffalo Soldiers, to protect and patrol Yosemite and Sequoia National Parks. Um, and at the time, um, during a peacetime deployment, they protected and preserved many of the areas that we now have hiking trails and picnic areas. And quite literally, they were among the country's very first national park rangers. They were led by a man by the name of Charles Young, who was the third African-American to graduate from the West Point Military Academy, but he was the first African-American superintendent of Sequoia National Park in 1903. And quite literally, at the dawn of the national park system, there were African Americans, there were people of color engaged and involved in the protection of these wild and scenic places. And we have to ask ourselves, what happened? What happened in the last hundred years that has changed this paradigm? Because if you go to Yosemite today, um, there are very few African Americans who are permanently stationed there and working as national park rangers. In fact, my friend Shelton Johnson is one of the only permanently stationed African American park rangers in Yosemite Valley today. But not unlike Lee Stetson in period dress and clothing, he tells the story of what it was like to be a Buffalo soldier in the turn of the century, the role that they played in the protection of our, of our national parks. And so in 2009, when the National Parks film was presented to President Obama in the White House, Shelton was there in the audience to actually tell him the story of the Buffalo Soldiers and the role that they played in the creation of this best idea that America ever had. One of the things that I think is critical of this particular meeting was not unlike Roosevelt meeting with John Muir, Shelton Johnson meeting with Barack Obama, I think had a pivotal impact on what happened next. Over the next eight years, Barack Obama designated more national parks and monuments than any other national, um, national park designee as a president in history. The only person besides um, Teddy Roosevelt that designated more national parks and monuments um, was Bill Clinton. And I think that that creates a fabulous legacy that opens up our national parks to a, sense, a, a, a feeling of welcome so that we can actually look and see that people of color are indeed part of this system. Um, and when we stop and we think about what the future can look like, it looks like a better cross-section of the American public. And we really have to take a look very carefully at what I'm talking about when I'm describing the adventure gap. Currently, African Americans represent 13% of the US population but only between two and 7% of all national park visitors. Now from the year 2000 to the year 2014, the uh, nation's black population grew 35% faster than the population as a whole. And similar statistics are actually true for Hispanic Americans and um, Asian Americans. And it's estimated that the black population is expected to grow from 45.7 million today to 74.5 million, making up 17.9% of the total US population by the year 2060. The, the population of people of color in this country is growing. In fact, it's estimated that by the year 2045, a majority of the population will be non-white. So the question is, what happens when this transition occurs, when a majority of the population is non-white? What happens if we fail to engage this emerging demographic? What happens if we don't do a better job of engaging and embracing the in interests of non-white people in the preservation of our public land? I think that it's very possible that if we fail to engage this emerging demographic, we could actually lose many of the wild and scenic places that we love today.
So the question though is how did we get here? What happened since the turn of the century that put us in the place that we are today? And fortunately, when we're talking about race relations in this country, we don't have to go all the way back to the 19th century and deconstruct slavery. In fact, much of the situation that we're in, in currently is the result of Jim Crow era segregation and discrimination during the 1930s. In fact, there was an, um, a, a custom um, commonly known as redlining in this country, um, where areas of where, where people could live were designated by racial segregation. In fact, if you take a look at the area where I grew up, um, here again is a map of where I grew up in Los Angeles. And, um, and, and at the time, Los Angeles and not unlike many cities across America, um, had federally designated maps that indicated where people of color could live. And, and as an African-American family growing up in the 1960s, our house was in a redlined area. In fact, this map drawn in 1937, it puts my home squarely in the middle of a deliberately black neighborhood. And if you take a look at all the red areas on this map, many of those areas are still primarily African-American today. The areas that you see in green are designed as the prime areas that are um, primarily areas where you see affluent white people. But one of the things that's most striking about these areas is that areas that have high affluence in the green areas are literally in green areas. They're, they're, they're on wooded lots. They have access to green space and nature. Well, the red areas are actually where we have higher propensities of pollution and of environmental degradation. And that translates to almost every major city in America. Um, just for the sake of, of, of this audience, um, I took the time to take a, um, a look at what Denver looked like in 1937. Um, this is a map, and forgive me, I don't know this area very well, but I would venture to guess that many of the red areas on this map that you see here are probably still predominantly Black or African American. And I would also guess, don't know this for a fact, you can um, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's probably it's very likely that these are areas where you see the most industrial pollution and also the most environmental degradation. It's important to realize that even our wild and scenic places were designated as for whites only or racially segregated. And also the modes of transportation between wild and scenic places were also segregated. Um, even our beaches you know, were designated as for whites only or for colored only. And it's these things that ultimately create the divide that began what, again, I describe as the adventure gap. And with the adventure gap comes very specific social impacts. Um, the first is de facto segregation. So if you can only live in a particular place, it's going to be a predominantly black or white neighborhood. Um, these areas were created by design. And ultimately we create what can be described as compulsory urbanization, uh, meaning that you are compelled to be in an urban area far away from nature. Also because we have um, a lower rate of home ownership and also a higher accruity of home price value, we have limited um, social mobility, uh, meaning that it's very difficult to create what is described as intergenerational wealth so that you can take the wealth and income that you accrue from owning a home and pass that down to your children. It ultimately becomes very difficult to have intergenerational transferable um, wealth. And also that means that People in these communities have far less disposable income, uh, meaning that they also probably have less leisure time. And these are the things that are required in order for us to have a um, thoughtful recreation background. And ultimately what this does geographically is to create a downward system of uh, spiral of poverty. And from these areas, we have the economically and social de socially depressed um, communities that we see today. Because much of what we are experiencing today is a direct re um, result of racial discrimination in the 1930s that in many ways was addressed very directly during my parents' era in the 1960s. In fact, if you take a look at 
um, this photograph of the March on Washington in 1964, much of what we are talking about when it comes to the elimination of racial discrimination and segregation was in the process of being dismantled then. But one of the things that I think is interesting is that while we're talking about all of these very urban and culturally um, social areas that are amenable to things like housing, employment, education, all of these things we were talking about back then, I believe that we were also talking about the importance of access to nature. In fact, if you take a look at the very last paragraph of the Eye of a Dream speech um, given by Martin Luther King Jr., he says the following, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prestigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. Now, he's talking metaphorically, but I think that that metaphor can be translated directly into um, a, a mission to actually spend time in nature. In fact, if you take a look at this issue of Ebony Magazine that came out in September of 1964, on the cover is the March on Washington as its biggest protest march in history. But um, on page 87, in the back of the same magazine is a profile of a man by the name of Charles Madison Crenshaw, who describes himself as a weekend climber. And he is a, um, a member of the, the production staff for the Boeing Corporate Corporation in Seattle, Washington. And in the 1940s, however, he was also a member of the Tuskegee Airmen. He was a, um, a, a line engineer for the uh, bomber escort fighter planes that were manned primarily by African-American pilots. Um, he actually came back to, to the United States, um, got a job working for Boeing in Seattle, Washington, but he also became a member of the Seattle Mountaineers. And as a leader of, of short climbing trips as a leader of, of rescue missions and, and other forms of outdoor recreation from a training perspective. In 1964, when they're putting the very the, the 37th expedition to the summit of Denali, then known as Mount McKinley, the highest peak in North America, Charles Crenshaw was the very first person to be invited on the team. And in this photograph, as, as he is part of this expedition, he's quite literally trying to ascend to the mountaintop, the highest physical point on our, in our country. And in 1964, as Martin Luther King Jr. is looking over the shoulder of Lyndon Johnson, the Civil Rights Amendment is being signed into law. And this is the codification of King's dream. But seven days later, Charles Crenshaw made it to the summit of Denali, and he quite literally realized King's dream and um, ascended to the mountaintop. And if you take a look at this photograph, it's difficult to tell who the African-American is. Um, th in this photograph, just so you know, Charles Crenshaw is the gentleman on the far right. The gentleman on the far left is, is um, Alan Randall, the expedition leader. The person in the middle is Alan's wife, Frances. That's a woman. She became the third woman on this expedition to reach the highest point in North America. So the thing I love most about this photograph is that I think that it beautifully illustrates that a person in, in nature can be judged not by the color of their skin, but indeed by the content of their character. Mountains don't discriminate. Altitude, cold temperatures, the um, rates of exposure have no compunction over who a person is other than their abilities and their skills as individuals. And, and uh, Crenshaw said at the summit, um, it, had, it had been so easy today for most of the climbers that it was hard for them to realize that they were actually standing on the summit of Mount McKinley, the highest point in North America. Climbers found themselves searching through the clouds for something yet higher. So what's higher than the highest physical point in North America? What's higher than 
the point in our history where we are quite literally realizing our dreams to become a better nation. And if we take a look at outdoor recreation, perhaps as a starting point, a place where we can all be equal, and if we can encourage a higher percentage of the population to become more in, interested and engaged in outdoor recreation, we can ultimately make civil rights and civil liberties available to everyone. So in, tw in 2014, 13, I had the privilege of being part of something pretty special. Um, working with the National Outdoor Leadership School, an organization also known as Knowles, we put together for the very first time an African-American team of climbers. Our goal was to take King, King and Crenshaw's dream to do something that had never been done before. Our goal was to put together the very first team of African-American climbers to ascend to the summit of Denali, a, a team of six men, three women, a total of nine climbers, um, made their way to Alaska to take King uh, Crenshaw's original dream of Denali in 1964 and almost 50 years later, bring it into the present uh, to create a new vision of outdoor recreation in a project that we called Expedition Denali. And our goal essentially was to quite literally change the face of the outdoors by creating a new cadre of role models and mentors that could go back into their communities and share these remarkable stories. It was the topic of my book, The Adventure Gap, Changing the Face of the Outdoors, and it's also the subject of a documentary film called An American Ascent. And from that expedition, we were actually able to change who a person can be identified as a climber. Um, and from this expedition, we literally changed the characters on the board so that now we see a broader cross section of the American public, specifically African Americans as part of this expedition. So much so that members of our group came back to their communities and did some pretty remarkable things. Some of our climbers went on to climb other mountains in Central and South America, in Africa. Um, one of our teammates actually um, led the very first all African American team ascent of, the, of Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. Others have come home to create careers for themselves in the National Park Service as rangers. In, in 2015, our team was invited to share our story with President Obama in the White House. And, um, and this photograph actually taken on the day that the Supreme Court they, um, designated the, con the constitutionality of gay marriage was, signed in, um, was, was made legal. And it was a pretty fabulous day in Washington. And we were there to tell the story of, of equality and outdoor recreation to a group of over 350 African-American and Hispanic youth from the DC metro area. And from this expedition and throughout much of the years that followed, we've seen the creation of a variety of new type of what I'll describe as affinity groups, organizations that identify specifically with cultural representation and identity uh, to create very specific places in nature for their people. Whether we're talking about Native Americans, Latinos, people with disabilities, people from the LGBTQ community, women, Native women, any group or underrepresented segments of the population, we now see as part of this paradigm that is out to recreation and ultimately a new generation of environmental stewards that will hopefully one day fight to protect the wild and scenic places that many of us love today. Now, it's very easy to see that the face of the outdoors is indeed changing. And we've done quite a bit to realize um, King's dream. And we're doing a fabulous job of making sure that there is better representation. Um, so much so that the changing face of the outdoors is becoming um, prominent in, on the covers of magazines on social media, in popular films, a few I've, I've created myself. And so now this is what the face of adventure looks like. But the question now is, are we done? Because I think that a lot of people have suggested that since we now have such great rates of representation, you know, we're pretty much finished, that there's no more work to do. But the reality is that the outdoors still isn't safe for everybody. The, Modern era has brought in a, um, a resurgence of racially motivated violence that 
uh, for a lack of a better word, is not much better than it was 100 years ago. And suddenly we find ourselves right back into the 1960s, um, where we're literally unpacking or redefining what it means to be an environmentalist today. So much so that we're going all the way back to the beginning and redefining what it means to be a, a part of the natural environment as an environmentalist or conservationist. But personally, I think that we really need no look further than our own backyards. Much of what I've described in terms of the adventure gap can actually be overcome in our own neighborhoods. And one of the things that I have the privilege of doing is helping to engage people, people like those on this call and in this audience, to work within their own communities to create safe and environmental places where young people especially can establish better relationships with the outdoors. I had the privilege of sitting on the board of the Aldo Leopold Nature Center. It's an experiential education learning center based right here in Madison, Wisconsin, in the heart of the urban of the urban area. But one of the things that I've encouraged them to do is change the language in their mission. So now our mission statement um, says very clearly, we believe that diverse communities are healthier in nature and in society. And when we're thoughtful about being inclusive in how we engage, educate, and empower, we help our community know that nature is for everyone and is a safe place to learn and explore. And if we can make sure that every single person who has these experiences recognizes that they have a place in it, we can ultimately grow the population of people who will be engaged and involved in these, um, in, in these conservation efforts. I also formally, but I'm still an active member of the um, Ice Age Trail Alliance, an organization dedicated to the preservation of the, one of the 11 National Scenic Hiking Trails here in the state of Wisconsin. You're probably familiar with the Continental Divide Trail in Colorado, but it's not unlike the Pacific Crest Trail or the Appalachian Trail. And again, by changing the language, we change the purpose of our mission. The Alliance acknowledges that in order to be a truly diverse and inclusive organization, we must exercise commitment to these goals in the way that we do business and how we interact with one another, our external partners, and the general public. In support of the mission of the Alliance, we are committed to recruiting, engaging, supporting, and cultivating leadership throughout all the communities we aim to serve. This is a mission that I would really like to encourage everyone to adopt regardless of your organization, regardless of your affiliation, there are opportunities where you can work very specifically to engage underrepresented segments of the population in roles of not just recreation, but also leadership, but ultimately stewardship. Um, so that when we go into the outdoors, it actually is indeed a place for everyone. And I think that it's critically important that as we're trying to understand everything that's going on in the world today, one of the things that we really have to realize is that it all starts with the environment. And I'm going to leave you with this quote from Theodore Roosevelt, who once said, the conservation of natural resources is the fundamental problem. Unless we solve that problem, it avails us little to solve all of the others. I want to definitely encourage each of you to try to find that area in your own backyard where you can make a personal and proactive effort to make the outdoors more accessible to everyone. I also want to um, put it in a quick plug um, for a book that I was able to contribute to, uh, specifically on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, a new title from, um, I, um, from DK Eyewitness called The U.S. National Parks Land of Wonder. And um, with that, I want to thank you um, very much for having me today. If you have questions or if there's anything that you'd like to know about me or more of my work, please visit my website at joychipproject.com. Again, I'm James Edward Mills, and it's been my pleasure to be with you, and I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to turn my camera on, and I would love to engage this audience in conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. Um, I'm Beatriz Soto. I'm, I run a program um, for the Wilderness Workshop that is the first program to be in Spanish, specifically for the Latino community. Um, just a little bit of background. Garfield County is actually 60% public lands. 
And the Latino community out here is 30% of the population. And I'm pretty sure we're a little bit more. The census is always a little iffy, but, um, and it's part of the White, um, the White River National Forest that is also one of the most visited, I think it's the most visited park in the United States. And the workforce that keeps a lot of this recreation economy going is the Latino community um, in this area that has really boomed and allowed you know, hotels and the ski resorts and all of that. Um, it's it's really the backbone. So we, I really appreciate you being here today and, and sharing your story and the need to diversify the outdoors and make sure that we're represented and we are all feel like stewards right of this land and continue this this great idea of of American public lands. Um, James, I wanted to ask you something, and and this is might be a little personal, but I always love to hear people's. Um, your your most memorable awe moment or your first awe moment when you were a kid that just really like that nature just really blew you away. And sometimes I, I love hearing those types of stories from people. Yeah, well, thanks for asking. And um, thank you again for having me. And also thank you for the work that you're doing, especially when it comes to engaging underrepresented segments of the population it, in an area that has such a high percentage of population that are people of color, I think yours is the type of community that can ultimately be a model for the rest of the country. So I, I applaud that and I definitely wanna encourage you to do more. To answer your question, um, I have a very specific, very vivid memory of a time when I had been backpacking much of my life, but one of the things that I didn't realize is how profound light pollution can be you know, and as a kid growing up in Los Angeles and even having gone on many overnight camping trips and looked up in the night sky to see the stars, this may sound naive, but at the time I literally thought that you could only see 10, 15, maybe 20 stars at any one time because you could only see the bright ones because of all the light. Um, when I was about 15 years old, I did a, a hiking trip uh, to the summit of Mount San Bernardino, which is one of the, the mountains in the San Gregorio, um, San Bernardino range near Los Angeles where I grew up. And on this particular hiking trip for the very first time, um, we were actually able to camp on the summit. It's 10,000 feet, but there's still plenty of open space to have um, a tent site. And it had been raining and we'd actually hiked above the clouds you know, so that the clouds were literally below us. We were actually able to hike through the clouds out of the rain into the clear blue sky. And by the time we were ready to set up our tents to camp, it was so clear we didn't need to even sleep in our tents. So I'm sleeping outside under, the under a blanket of stars and I look up and I have never seen so many stars in my entire life. And it was quite literally, quite literally a naked eye Milky Way viewing opportunity. And if you've never experienced such a thing, and I think in Colorado, many of you probably have, but the, I was 15 years old before I saw that for the first time. And it was at that moment that I realized that it was something that was profound for me. I literally felt like I was part of the entire universe, you know, and I felt small and insignificant, but still part of a great whole. And I think that it was really at that moment that I decided that this is something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. That this is something that I wanted to be part of my profession, part of my passion, my vocation, you know, and things that I do on a daily basis. And, and that is a moment that I'm going to carry with me for the rest of my life. Thank you. I absolutely love that story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in your book, you mention loving nature to death. Um, and this is something, you know, that we we feel around a lot in our area in Peking County, Eagle County, because we, we start to see so many more people visiting, going deeper into certain areas and with social media posting where people are. And even to the point where there's starting to be a lot of pollution in our little water streams and, and there's this concern about loving places to death. 
But I always feel like there's this hard balance, right? That you want more people, more diverse people um, being able to access these areas. But at the same time, you wanna, you wanna protect them, right? Because we wanna put biodiversity and ecosystems first. Um, I guess I would love to see your insight on like, what, what do you feel is, is the right balance, the right message um, to not cross over, you're not welcome here, ecosystems are we poor people. Um, anyway, I would love to, to hear your approach on that as well. And thank you for asking that because that is indeed the problem because uh, early in my career, I think a lot of people were suggesting that the last thing we wanted to do is get more people in the outdoors. You know, and to me, it's not a question of numbers. To me, it's a question of diversity, you know, so that you have an equal mix of all the people who go into the outdoors, but inevitably that's still gonna mean more people. And so if you take a look at an example, as I started this conversation, like the Grand Canyon, 4.5 million people will be able to visit the rim. You know, you can go hiking, you know, you can sleep in a hotel, you can go on a, on a burrow ride to the bottom. Um, but in many ways, that particular part of the park is kind of like Disneyland. You know, and they've got lines and you get permits and you queue up and and um, there's garbage collection and it's just like a, a, a big natural city. But if you go just a mile down the trail, the numbers start to diminish. And it's at that point, it's, you know, people who um, are, you know, a little bit more intrepid, you know, people who are, are prepared to make a, a few more sacrifices in terms of their comfort. Now, unfortunately, that does limit people's ability, you know, people who might be in wheelchairs or the elderly or the otherwise differently abled will have difficulty making their, their way down trail systems. But the further away you get from the mass, the fewer people that you have. And it's at that point, we need to start practicing the principles of leave no trace you know, of being able to, you know, recognize the privilege of being in these areas, but also the fragility of the environment that you're in. And then ultimately, and this is, you know, the, the, the real upshot of this, as I said before, to only 29,000 people will make the trip down the Grand Canyon. Now, the, the National Park Service has determined that 29,000 is the optimal number of people that can be allowed to go down there um, to, um, Literally, a big part of the, the that number is the the river's ability to carry the capacity of human urine. You know, it's the the, the twenty nine thousand people is the maximum amount of urine that can be allowed in the Colorado River before it becomes polluted. So that's the that is the the magic number. But you've got to pack everything else out. You can't leave anything behind. And, um, but again, a, a very small number of people. And as I mentioned before, um, we waited 15 years to get a permit to go down the Grand Canyon. You know, and so uh, there are ways to limit the number of people. There's our, there are ways to limit our impact. You know, the question is, are we prepared to wait? You know, are we prepared to um, let other people go before us? Now, sadly, um, you know, I'll wait 15 years for a permit, but if I have $10,000 or $5,000, I can go tomorrow if I, if I paid enough money to get a, um, a, a seat on a, a rafting crew and, and pay the, 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 fa the fare. So that means that there's a distinction between who can afford to go. You know, and so then it becomes a socioeconomic issue. The last thing I want is to only have our natural resources available to the wealthy. You know, and so that's why a lottery system is actually very effective. But lastly, I'll, I'll say that part of it too is going to other places, you know, because everyone's heard of Yosemite, for example, but who's heard of Hetch Hetchy Wilderness? Okay, Hetch Hetchy Wilderness is literally right next to Yosemite and it has like a 10th of the traffic because it's not as spectacular, it's not as well known, but it's just as beautiful in its own way. There's always gonna be a smaller river, another lower scale area with fewer people that will cost less where the permits are easier to get. I think that it's really just a matter of spreading out. 
and, and trying to have as many experiences as we possibly can, but, and, and at the same time, limiting our impact in the areas that we go. Leave no trace, pack out what you pack in. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I kind of wanted to read something for your, from your book that, um, that I really, really enjoyed and it really resonated with me too. And it's the mountain affects not only our reflections on the past, but also influences the way we think about the future. It allows us to realign our priorities and consider life from a new perspective. And even though this is a story based in fact, there's spiritual transformation that occurs between fantasy and reality that lies at every heart of every adventure. That was by far, I think, one of my favorite my favorite parts. And I, I really enjoyed your book. I actually just finished it this morning. I, I'm like, I, I have to read it. And I was totally hooked on it. Um, and I loved how you took me through history and, and brought me to the past and the present and, and the characters of, of these real people that you're showing um, so much beyond color, but who they are and, and, and their values. And I'm, I'm not a, a, a mountaineer by any chance. I've, I've climbed, I do hiking, I snowboard, but it just, it really brought me to this, this whole nother world. And I, I really appreciate all of it. And um, I guess how, I know you you've transferred your your career and, and your journey, but you know just being out in nature, how has that influenced like your everyday path and 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 how did that shift who you started out to be as a younger boy and and who you are now as a man and your journey and your priorities? It, I think nature has been been a huge part of that, but can you just kind of open up more of that um, whole experience? Sure. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting because I think that um, you know, to your question, I really have to. Well, first of all, I need to thank my parents, you know, for creating, um, you know, the space for me to explore. You know, and they were both civil servants. You know, they um, they we weren't wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, but we were you know black middle class Southern California you know, too professional, intact family, um, you know, without, you know, a lot of the things that many families deal with, you know, um, no drug or alcohol abuse, no physical abuse, you know, I really had a great life, you know, and that in and of itself, you know, allows me a certain level of privilege. Second, I also was imbued with that privilege, a certain amount of obligation you know, to make sure that I'm also looking out for the interests of other people and not just my own interests, you know, because I honestly believe that in order for us to enjoy these natural resources for ourselves, we have to make sure that there are plenty of natural resources for other people too. And so when I began my career in outdoor recreation, I mean, one of the things that I was really looking forward to doing is just being an outdoor guy you know, and spending time in nature. And, but the thing is, you still have to make a living, <laughs> you know, and you still have to, you know, figure out how you're going to put a roof over your head and, and, and pay the bills and everything else. But I was actually very fortunate to be able to cobble together um, a variety of different uh, jobs and resources. Um, as an independent sales representative, I was actually able to make a very good living. The problem though, is that, you know, if you put too much effort into, do, you know, doing what you're supposed to do, <laughs> you know, you wind up missing out on a lot of different things. And so that's kind of where the fantasy aspect of what you read in my book kind of comes into play. I think it's really important that we dream. You know, we dream about things that are impossible. We dream about things that are unlikely. And then we start taking steps towards fulfilling those dreams, whatever they happen to be. And it, and it doesn't have to be like climbing a big mountain. It could literally you know, be, you know, something relatively small. I mean, this morning is a perfect example. Um, it's a, you know, chilly day early this morning in, in Madison. I had this presentation to prepare for plus two magazine articles that I'm writing. And one of the things that I realized, especially in the time of COVID when we're all working from home, you could literally work yourself to death. And the people that you're working for will let you. You know, because we have so little distance between our day-to-day -day lives and our work and everything else. And so, you know, with the cooperation of my very supportive wife, 
you know, um, she allowed me to take the car that we share to go fly fishing this morning on a lake, on a river about 30 minutes from our house. And it was really very fulfilling for me because being able to catch fish on a, in a watershed that in a community that I live in um, with neighbors whose farm fields and um, whose agriculture and, and industry supports my livelihood um, allows me to, to center myself, to be able to have a positive experience in the outdoors, to be able to be calm enough in my thinking to be able to know where the fish likely are to make the proper fly selection, to cast the line in the water and bring the fish onto shore, um, remove the hook and send it back into the water. I mean, there, there's, there's craft in that, that is cultivated through practice, you know, and, and in many ways it's kind of meditative. And I, and that's something that I found for myself that I'm very grateful to all the people who've helped me to get there. I wanna encourage anyone who's listening to me right now to find whatever that is for themselves. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be ultra physical. It certainly doesn't have to be expensive, um, but it could be going for a hike. It can be bird watching. Um, you know, in Colorado, you have lots of opportunities um, to go skiing. If you can't afford a lift ticket, backcountry skiing, you know, typically just requires a, a backcountry permit, you know, and, you know, a little bit more equipment, but all in all, it kind of balances itself out, you know, and you can find the, the cheap and affordable gear that's necessary to have, you know, whatever scale or size of adventure you want to have. And, and I really want to encourage everyone to find whatever their thing is. You know, and I, again, I've been really lucky to find a few things, um, but a big part of that is having conversations like this one to make sure that I'm encouraging people to do the same. And if there's ever anything that I can do to help, you know, if it's just writing this book, or, you know, or telling a few stories or introducing people to the history, heritage, and legacy of their ancestry relative to their place on the land. I think that's a good place to start. Thank you, James. Alex, are we doing good on time? Can I ask another question? I just wanna make sure. We are just about finished. We have time for one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, thank you. Um, James, you really mentioned about COVID and working from home and kind of, um, I've, I've personally felt like I've worked more than ever in my life and, and you're absolutely right. It does be kind of come intrusive in, in your space. Um, I, I kind of, just to close it off, um, I would love, you know, I always feel um, over this past summer with COVID and like a lot of the racial kind of confrontations that we had in our country. And I'm also doing a lot of work on environmental justice issues as well, specifically affecting communities of color. I feel like we're always fighting against the clock. And I always feel like we're in these systems that are really oppressive. And even though I, I do connect to the outdoors and I know a lot of my community does as well, I almost feel like we take one step forward and we take two steps backwards and there's always a sense of, of desperation. Um, how do you stay optimistic? How, what, what really works for you to stay positive and, and frame all these, these things that, you know, these negative feelings that end up sometimes invading our mind, our work and, and, Again, there's a sense of desperation and feeling like we're not accomplishing much. How do you how do you find that positive, optimistic um, lens to keep on doing the doing the work? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, much of what I do comes out of my own love of the outdoors, I and mean, that that's the start. And I think that anything that you do from a spirit of love, you know, is almost guaranteed a positive outcome. So I think that it's important that you start there then I think that it's really important to give the things that you want to get. You know, so if you want to have access or time or resources, I think that it's really important that you cultivate the time and energy and resource for other people. Because inevitably, if you connect someone else, chances are there's going to be a better connection for you. So for example, um, one, among the many projects that I'm, I'm doing is trying to uh, figure out how to facilitate such things. And especially during COVID when 
um, everyone was was hunkered down and were in need of um, of physical social distancing and, and physical and cultural restrictions. Um, you know, I created what I've called an escape pod. And an escape pod is basically a group of people who collectively decide that you're going to be COVID safe, that you're going to um, get a negative COVID um, test. And this is before the vaccine, obviously. Um, and um, we're going to have a communal gathering. We'll um, take um, separate transportation and then we're going to go someplace. And I led two trips, one in the summer to um, the ICH National Scenic Hiking Trail, which I, I shared with you. I took a group of African-American men and their sons for the very first overnight hiking experience, you know, in a COVID safe environment in a place where we basically had the entire trail all to ourselves for a weekend. Um, a couple of weeks ago this winter, I, I led a similar group from Detroit and Grand Rapids, Michigan to the Pictured Rock Scenic Lakeshore on the Upper Peninsula of Upper, upper Peninsula of Michigan to go ice climbing, the exact same thing. You know, but what's, what's great is because I was actually able to work specifically with people who could go back into their communities and share their experiences with others, I was actually able to get quite a bit of grant funding to be able to um, cover the, not only cover the costs for everyone to be there, we were able to provide them with um, technical equipment and clothing, transportation, and a stipend, you know, so, um, you know, we paid them to have a great time, you know, mainly because you know, we were literally taking them away from work. You know, these are our, you know, um, upper, well, middle income working people that don't have the capacity to do these things otherwise. And so we ultimately had two fantastic trips that were fully funded and paid for. I, I wrote some nice little stories about it. We got some great photography. We did some wonderful storytelling and that I'm hoping motivates other people to go out and have similar experiences for themselves. So much of my optimism comes from my efforts to inspire that same level of optimism in other people. Most importantly, I just think it's really important that anyone who's doing these things realizes that they're not by themselves. They're not doing this alone and that there's community that we can build around this so that everyone can be made to feel safe and welcome in the outdoors. Thank you, James. Well, please let us know if you are ever in our area. We have amazing ski resorts and just amazing access to public lands. And every day, like you say, we're working hard to make sure it represents the community we live in and the community that's actually making these places thrive. So again, I, I really appreciate um, your time today. Um, Alex, I'll let you take it away. It's my pleasure. Beatrice, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you, James. Oh. Thank you, James, for being here with us. And thank you, everybody who's watching. Thank you so much, Beatrice, for being our facilitator today and enjoy the rest of your vacation. This was very riveting and we're looking forward to, to delving more into it. I know I'm looking forward to reading the book as soon as I can. And just to everybody who's, who's out there, if you would like to share this video or revisit it, it will be recorded both in Spanish and English and it will be posted on our library's Facebook and YouTube. Um, thank you also to Albert and Dea, our interpreters for today. They worked really hard to make sure we can reach um, our Hispanic population and we're very pleased to have them as well. Um, with that, I will go ahead and end the night. Thank you again, James and Beatrice for being with us. Please enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you, good night everyone. Buenas noches. Hasta luego.